my prime experience lies with the area of bugs. And uh, so it's my, my first big step into the frog arena. And when I started to research for this talk, uh, I was really surprised just how powerful frogs are. I knew from my work at Melbourne Water that, that the frogs have a lot of political way on their, on their fragile little shoulders. Uh, for example, in the west of Melbourne, a lot of development is hinged on protection of uh, growling grass frogs, which are federally uh, listed. And you can't just roll out the tra tractors and bulldozers and um, build houses on their habitat. Uh, and you know, uh, using that excuse, Melbourne Water and other organizations, organizations are trying to use frogs for protection of uh, a, a lot of other habitats and the whole of that ecosystem, that grassland ecosystem there as well. And researching for this talk, I found out, I'm not sure if you already know, you probably already know that today is the Save the Frog Day. Did you know that? 28th of April? It, internet says so, then it, then it certainly is. Uh, certainly everybody, and we're probably the first people who celebrated because uh, we are the first in the globe to meet uh, April the 28th. So congratulations and happy Save the Frog Day. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what is what do we meet by the ecosystem and food chain and um, I know there is a wonderful community of frogs in this area but personally I don't know them well enough so I, I felt like I, I really should talk about something I know, know a little bit about rather than tell you something that I know less than you. Uh, so I will talk about ecosystems and, and, and uh, food chains and we'll talk about what the tadpoles eat and what frogs eat and things like that. So um, ecosystems, sometimes when people talk about ecosystems they really mean habitat and sometimes when people talk about habitat they mean ecosystem. So um, ecosystem really is a combination of habitat and the species that, that occupy that particular habitat and the abiotic factors that that govern that, uh, that particular habitat. So for example, if you look at the flooded uh, grassland, there is, there is a lot to it apart from the place where you can find the frogs. So there is a water quality, salinity has been mentioned here already. There are, there are other species that occupy that habitat and all of that will make that ecosystems that the frogs will be affected. So biotic and abi abiotic factors, hydrology, uh, you know, how often does it flood? Does it flood once in 10 years? Does it flood every day? Uh, things like that. What is the air quality? What is the presence of, you know, that uh, fungus, for example, that, that uh, often controls the population of frogs? So what uh, do we say when the ecosystem is healthy and how does it affect the, um, the food web of the frogs? So healthy ecosystem implies processes and complex processes. For example, if you go back to your uh, grass um, land uh, or your marsh, the, the healthy processes mean, will mean um, a certain circulation of nutrients, things like nitrogen and phosphorus. It will imply that uh, the, the, plant, the plant growth is not uh, catastrophic as it sometimes can be that you know, there is a healthy balance between growth of plants and growth of algae. Uh, that you don't have too much nutrients or too little nutrients, uh, that they're released in a, in a way that is suitable for the ecosystem uh, habitat, uh, ecosystem inhabitants, ecosystem inhabitants. Often you can tell that the processes within the ecosystem are, well, good, for lack of a better word, is by looking at the structure of the ecosystem. So if you have a really high biodiversity, it probably means that processes within the ecosystems are healthy, natural, all of those words. Uh, and that would also mean that the food uh, webs that we will encounter within the ecosystems are complex. So uh, the typical degradation of the habitat starts when your food web is going to turn into a, a food chain. And then later on, I will give a couple of slides of what, what do I actually mean. It basically means 
a, a, a very strong simplification of your food web. So rather than, if you imagine that our food web consists of really healthy choice of food, especially in the West, if you imagine that uh, your choice of food is reduced to bread only, that would be a reduction of your food web. And that's not a healthy thing. Although it's not going to kill us, we're going to be extremely bored, and that will probably reflect on other animals around us. Uh, another aspect of the healthy ecosystem is that it can recover. It can recover from disturbance, which is natural, things like floods, things like droughts. OK, there, there is a marsh with you know, thousands of critters inside there, with tadpoles and adult frogs, and it has dried up for five years. What does it mean? If this is something like that happens in an urban wetland that is basically dug up by Melbourne water to treat storm water, that's probably not a good thing. If you have your natural uh, marshes that I have seen by uh, while I was driving here, there is really lovely uh, shallow lakes and marshes even along the road. If it has this really complex, um, well, set of mechanisms that I that are ad adapted to cope with something like that, then after reflooding after five years, three months later you will probably find similar um, biodiversity to what it was when it was wet. So how does this? Ecosystem health relates to tadpole diet and, and uh, frog diet. I've already uh, mentioned that, that their, uh, their choices will become uh, wider, so um, they will probably, it'll probably be easier for them to find food as well, so, which means high rate of reproduction, which high rate of reproduction means further dispersal. They can actually go to a neighboring pond, and we will have deafening core of frogs in no time. I'm sure you all really want that to happen. Uh, and you know, you have a really quite a healthy popular um, community of frogs here. I'm sure 20% of it is probably more common and 80% you, you, know, you hardly ever see. But still, theoretically speaking, there are three species of Litoria, of the tree frogs. Uh, so there are, there are 12 species altogether. You know, barking marsh frog and biberon stodlet and uh, out of tree frogs, my favorite is parents tree frog, which I will, will show uh, later on. Uh, really quite a spectacular little beast. Um, yeah, this is a slide just to show you something you already know, that you have several number of frogs in the area. Now, the tadpole diet and uh, people who ever kept, has anybody kept frogs at home, tadpoles? Uh, did you know it's illegal? You have to have a permit? Yeah, I'm sure you all have permits. <laughs> I know, this is what, this is, this is exactly my thoughts. I used to do, I used to, why can't we do it today? Uh, there are quite strict rules. Um, I don't know if, has anybody touched on it before? No? I, I missed, I missed the talk, yeah, that you need to have permits and it's, unless you're school. Unless you're primary school. I think primary school is all exempt. So you just declare yourself a primary school and you'll be fine. Uh, we kept a, 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 a frog. Sometimes when we go to a field trip, in other words, we collect things and occasionally, accidentally, we collect a, a tadpole and we don't want to kill it, so we put it somewhere in a kind of aquarium in the office. We, we ended up with um, stripy marsh frog in the office. And that was, it was great. It, we kept it for a little while and then we released it back. And also a couple of tadpoles. And, you know, people just go, well, how do we feed the tadpoles? Uh, let's give it something, you know, a piece of ham, some bugs, <laughs> uh, whatever was left over from, for, for lunch. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing that they kind of, you know, tadpoles, they seem to be quite active. They, they swim reasonably fast. Uh, you know, they, they look like something that will probably hunt insects. But uh, aquatic insects, and you know, I thought, oh great, I can talk about aquatic insects. I'll just say frogs on the first slide, and the rest on the first slide, and the rest of the talk will be just aquatic, about aquatic bugs, which is something I know about. But I actually can't do that because tadpoles, their diet is relatively simple. Uh, so they 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 feed on decaying matter. Uh, they, their probably closest encounter with aquatic bug is when it dies, 
and grows like fungus on its on the surface of its body, and that's when tadpole gets tadpoles get excited. Uh, they have tiny little set of teeth, which are not really good for anything else but rasping, I think. Uh, then uh, you will see that the tadpole here is kind of a swimming swimming am among the forest of um, of fungal growth here. So uh, sometimes they filter through their gills, and but mostly they use you know they eat uh, bacterial and fungal biofilm. So what is their uh, ecosystem needs? What 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 do they need apart from you know a little bit of uh, decaying matter for their food? Well. Availability of clean and uh, still water, slowly flowing water. And it needs to be at least there for a certain period of time. So when frog lies its eggs, well, it really is making a bet uh, on the fact that this water body is going to stay there for, I don't know how long it will take for the tadpole to develop, but maybe about at least three weeks. Uh, this is a photograph, I will be, I'll have to describe the photographs to you from now on. Uh, this is a photograph of a, of a drying, a pool, drying pool, and there is a black mass in the middle of it, and they're all tadpoles. So, uh, some t well, if you're lucky, you maybe will be able to, to see it in the wild. I've never seen it myself, but I can imagine what it would look like. And in the actual fact, the, uh, the tadpoles, when they encounter this, situ this situation, there is obviously a, a fierce competition for food. And sometimes they release chemical that slows down all other tadpoles. So they kind of, if you do it first, <laughs> then it slows everybody else. And hopefully that chemical doesn't slow you down. But uh, you get to develop faster than all the other tadpoles. And therefore, well, you have less competition as soon as you come out from the, uh, from the pond. And of course, during the drought, that was a real issue for our local uh, I'm sure the drought has affected this area as well in a really big way. And the frog populations, I'm, I don't know, well, with, do you have frog sensors here? There has probably been a, a reduction in, the frog, in frog numbers because of the drying ponds. But it's not really an Australian problem either. He is a, a poster designed for the Save the Frog Day. Uh, and uh, it, I think it's in the Yellow, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, it says, I live in Yellowstone National Park, the world's oldest protected area, but I'm not protected from climate change. So things like, um, where would the tadpoles, where would you find tadpoles in your area? One of the typical areas are river floodplains. So things like uh, ephemeral pools uh, in a grassland, depressions filled with water, Unfortunately, a lot, of this, uh, a lot of this land is a usable land for cattle and for horticulture. So it gets plowed and it gets, it gets drained. So you can see a little red, little red stick in the middle. That's the, uh, a pipe for drainage. And you can see how the tractors go and you know, develop the land. It's not the, same. it's not the same area, but you know, imagine it could be the same area. So the water, well, I mentioned the water needs to be clean, and it needs to be clean, you know, especially if the, the, the habitat is near agricultural area. You really don't want things like pesticides and herbicides getting there. Frogs, as you know, have very thin skin, and tadpoles are not really protected from uh, heavy agricultural chemicals either. Uh, so whenever you, you have any surface water pollution or even groundwater pollution, that will affect the frogs. And it, I think it's pretty obvious. And unfortunately, it does happen very much. And as far as abiotic um, factors go, mosquito fish are really big predators. So we brought in mosquito fish from, I think, South America to eat mosquitoes. And they do eat mosquito larvae. They're quite, um, I'm in Melbourne water, one of my little jobs is to uh, control mosquitoes. And when these fish get into area where mosquitoes are active, yes, you will, we will have less mosquitoes, no doubt. But they will also eat everything else. They will eat frog eggs, and they will, they will uh, nibble on uh, tadpoles as well, on their, on their um, tail. And because there are so many of them, and they're so aggressive, 
they can pretty much tear it in pieces if they want to, and they often do. So not a really a welcoming friend. I don't know if you have a lot of problems with mosquito fishing here, but I bet they're very common. So next time you see like little ripples when you come to a pond, things escaping as you approach, and they often, very often, hang around the banks of the of the uh, pond or a stream. Then you know you have a, a little issue with uh, with fish. So you could have all other factors there, but this fish will prevent uh, frogs from colonizing your habitat. So if uh, all conditions are met, then you'll have a reasonably healthy habitat and they also love the aquatic plants because this is, this is somewhere they can hide, this is something they can hold on to, this is something they can use to crawl out. Uh, and this is an example uh, of ideal little pond for, for tadpoles, although it's a little bit red on your screen. So what about the adult frogs, though? So adult frogs, they're like many other animals. They will need shelter. They will need somewhere to escape from predators. They will need shaded, shady areas. So that's quite important in central Victoria. You've got fantastic variety of ecosystems here. But in a lot of cases, I bet you could do with a few more trees that will provide shade, especially in a riparian zone where frogs can hide from high temperatures during summer. Uh, they need opportunity to disperse wide variety and abundance of prey that we're going to talk about. They need to sing a song. That's one of their needs, kind of a little bit more artistic expression. And they need to find habitat to lay eggs. So what about, I'm going to concentrate from now on to the variety and abundance of prey. Uh, for frogs, because in this respect they're a little bit more interesting than tadpoles. So if tadpoles just eat on, on slime, if you like, then um, uh, adult frogs, they, uh, they prefer more variety, and that's fantastic. Now the first one, this frog, you can't really see it. It's, it's not a local frog, it's an African frog. And you can see the poor thing has stuck with, with half a mice. Uh, Half a, half a mouse inside its mouth. Uh, I, I can imagine it's a little bit ticklish. When you, uh, when you read about frog diet, kind of, you know, people tend to highlight the fact that they don't just eat invertebrates. They just go, oh, often you encounter, well, in terms of uh, with the growling grass frogs, we all know that they eat other frogs. It's a reasonably li large animal, so that can eat small lizards, they can eat frogs, they can probably eat, well, I don't know, small bird, a tiny, something tiny. Uh, so they kind of eat something that is the right size and something that moves. I was told the story in a car that a frog has eaten a Christmas light, confusing it for the glow worm. And that's kind of, it's possible, especially if the glow light, if, if the Christmas light was moving around. They kind of go for something that is quite obvious. Uh, and the frog has survived, by the way. So uh, although, yes, they will eat vertebrates and kind of some unusual stuff, probably 90% of their diet are invertebrates. You know, the stuff that you see every day. Insects, crickets, well, which are insects, and things like that. So, their diet will probably be determined where the frogs shelter. And f frogs shelter in leaf litter, they shelter underneath rocks and logs. Uh, they sometimes dig themselves in. So if I was a frog, I'd be eating something that is close by without trying to you know, invent something. So invertebrates in leaf litter, and I'm not sure about the common name of this bug, but you probably all know it, and in different parts of the country it's probably called something different. Slater, yes. I called an eye support, but that's kind of a really boring name. I think Slater is a much better name. So apart from Slater's in leaf litter, what would you find? What else would you find in leaf litter? You'll find things like beetle larvae. Worms. Worms, that's right, yeah. Uh, 
slugs, you will find things like, um, what did I have? Beta larvae, sand hoppers. Do you guys know of sand hoppers? They're amphipods. So when you move leaf litter, you'll see things hopping, and they are uh, crustaceans. They just have a similar needs in a shelter, similar to frogs. So they, they don't want to be desiccated, and that's, that's where they live, and they just kind of chew on pretty much anything. So they will be the, like a prime target for the frogs. When they are in soil, well, there will be, this is like a huge witchery grub type of thing. It's a bit of lava. Uh, when they are in the soil, they will, well, they will eat for, they will look for something in the soil, and that would be like earthworms, that would be uh, beetle larvae, that will be anything that digs itself in. Now, under logs and rocks, you'll have uh, the usual suspects, the, yeah, slugs, snails, <coughs> things like earwigs, spiders. They're probably all part of the frog menu. In uh, your bottom right, there is a Littoria peroniae, Peronia, uh, parents tree frog. You can recognize that frog because its eye looks like a target, like a crosshair. And I thought it's fantastic, you know, I will never ever mix it up with anything else if I ever see it, but I'll probably never see it. Uh, they, uh, apart from other things, I think they climb, they, they climb trees really well, and they also lodge themselves in a eucalyptus bark uh, between the, the trunk and the bark, and you can uh, very often find them in there. So they would be pro they would be targeting a bug community that lives underneath the bug, which is quite you know quite rich. You can find ants in there, termites, and you can find this uh, uh, bark cockroaches. You know sometimes people call them bush cockroaches. They actually don't look like cockroaches much at all. If you think about your household cockroaches with wings and Running really fast, and you know, when you switch on the light in the kitchen, that's my experience of frogs, of uh, sorry, cockroaches. Uh, these guys are really slow, and they're kind of more like beetles rather than frogs. So they would eat them. Uh, and flying insects. Uh, this is a picture of uh, of a frog with it looks like something like a cigarette in its mouth, a blue cigarette. But it's not really a blue cigarette, it's the remnants of a, of a damselfly. So if you imagine the damselfly with its lovely thin and bright body, just ended up inside the frog's mouth. And uh, you can imagine how fast the frogs can be. So uh, there is a claim that frogs can catch a fly in the midst of flight, so they just sit there. Especially like surface flies, you know those hovering flies? Yellow and black, they're small. And they can kind of hover in the middle, and just before they land on the flower, they hover and then they land. Well, imagine frogs can be targeting them. There is actually an internet video, a, 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 uh, an ad. I was searching for God knows what um, frog related, and the, the best video I could find was frog catching a fly, and which looked like natural, but then fly, the fly takes the frog away in a, in a sunset, and it, and then there is a car commercial goes so powerful it can do anything. <laughs> I was like, oh God, I can't use that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was quite funny. The, the, the first part of it was, uh, uh, yeah, very entertaining. So back to uh, the the food. This is not obviously yeah the structure of it could have been better. But uh, you know how we talked about food chain and food web, and I said I will. I will talk about it. This is a, a textbook example of really simple uh, food chain where one thing eats the other thing. It really doesn't happen in a real life because in real life things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, he, so he is a caterpillar eating a plant and then, f then there is a frog that looks a little bit like a hamster. Uh, <laughs> really, it does, doesn't it? Uh, and, and then really badly drawn snake, and, and even worse drawn uh, owl. But it will give you a kind of a good illustration of, you know, if things are not doing well, you will, you could end up with something like that. You know, poor frogs only feeding on some agricultural-related 
insect that eats on crops because there is nothing else. And there will be only one species of snake that feeds on frog, you know, and maybe you'll have one species of kite if you're lucky. So we don't want that to happen. We need to keep our ecosystem diverse. And to do that, we really need to provide uh, a diversity of vegetation. Diversity of vegetation will mean diversity of in, uh, invertebrate fauna and therefore much better choice for the frogs. And when you have a variety of frogs, an abundance of frogs, the snakes are going to thank you and the birds are going to be happy. I know it's a little bit of an idealistic part of my speech, but you know, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, so you might end up with something a little bit more complicated, something like that. And this is sort of all heavily related to aquatic ecosystems. You, you have water, uh, you have uh, water beetle. I'm not sure what water cricket refers to. It's kind of a strange thing. Uh, but yeah, wheel-legged beetles and things like that. And it's just an illustration of what you would expect from a much more complex uh, food relationship when many things eat other many things. And you know, you probably see a, a, an arrow from a frog dying and you know, going back, providing nutrients for plants and so forth. And the whole, whole thing repeats itself. So this is a, a map of, of your area. I'm not sure where we are. We're in Castleman. We're in that brown bit. Uh, yes, uh, you, uh, and just uh, a diff different bioregion. So it's very uh, a rich and diverse in terms of bioregion. They, 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 this north, north central CMA. You have uh, Murray, uh, Mali, and Murray fans in the blue there. Central Victorian uplands in, in uh, blue. The browns are gold fields where we are, the Victorian Riverina. And a lot of it, I imagine, has been occupied by the uh, grasslands and savanna-like vegetation as well. So going back one step and looking at that food web, we, we looked at things that, that frogs eat. What about animals that eat frogs? Because the food web implies that it's not the end. You know, the, you, our frogs are not the top predator. They're not the top dog by any account. So you have a variety of birds and variety of snakes that don't mind a bit of a taste of, of frog f flesh. Uh, and that's kind of something that you already know. That, that's fair enough. Uh, some, Sometimes not in Australia, but in Europe, you can uh, you can encounter something like this: crispy fried frog legs. I have actually tried frog frog legs. I'm um, not really ashamed to say because it was back in the in the mother country, back in Russia. Frogs there are large; they're quite a bit larger. I'll say without false pride. Um, here, here I um, I just had a sticker. I just looked at sticker that says. Australian biggest frog on actually eco bananas. You can you can see the frog sticker and it says 10 centimeters. I thought 10 centimeters. How many frogs do you need to have a decent meal? <laughs> I don't know what they taste like. I tasted them, but you know, don't ask me to uh, recall the taste. No, uh, I only had tiny amount and it was prepared by my university zoology teacher, so that was kind of felt okay. It's legitimate. Uh, so you have higher animals, you have, you have higher vertebrates, most of the time eating frogs as well. Unless you have amazing water bugs. Um, basically it was showing a, a, an aquatic beetle with massive jaws looking like pincers just sitting there and there is a water flowing and then the, the, the beetle lover turns around and catches a tadpole and it pinches it with its pincers and it kind of penetrates it and uh, it sucks its juices out using a pharyngeal pump. You can actually see it. Sometimes uh, some bugs can be large enough and hungry enough to actually catch a tadpole as well and you know that moves them a little bit further in that um, food chain. But mostly you know frogs are 
Yeah, they're relatively small. They're really not big enough to eat, and uh, they have this cuteness about them. Maybe because they, well, they're quite vulnerable with their thin skin, and they have four legs and bulgy eyes that make, make them look like probably humans. Maybe this is why they win. This is why they're so powerful. So, yeah, that's my kind of impression of frog topic and its food chain. Thank you.